So in section 3.3, we're going back to just talk about building the models, and then we're going to, in chapter 4, come back and talk about one painful way to solve systems. You thought variation of parameters was painful. You just wait. You have no idea. Uh, we'll do solving systems by elimination, and then we'll come back and talk about some alternative techniques that require, while it's actually less work to do, it's much more complicated to understand. So the two different ways I'm going to give you to solve systems is the one way that makes perfect sense but takes three pages to solve to the one that is very difficult to understand and a lot of conceptual background foundation, eigenvalues, eigenvectors go into it to be able to solve in much less work, but you'll have a better, um, better understanding of the system as a whole when you do that. So there's a reason for both approaches, okay? Um, and I'm going to give you both of them, okay? F of t, um, x, and y, and then a g of t, x, and y. So notice how the x's and the y's, the dependent variables, show up on the right-hand side. They're intermixed, so they're actually in both equations. The, the independent variable also can show up. A lot of the systems that we can talk about actually end up being autonomous as well. An autonomous system would look like dx dt equals f of xy and dy dt is equal to g of xy, right? Because what makes something autonomous? It doesn't depend on time, right? It's, it's time independent. <clears throat> so let me give you two models that are um, fairly easy to understand where the equations come from but turn out to be based on, on systems, or turn out to be systems. So take the mixing problem, and instead of having one tank with one input and one output, let's have two tanks that are mixing together with each other. Okay. So I'm going to represent my two tanks by boxes. I mean, this could be like uh, two tanks. This could be uh, two lakes connected by some tributary. Doesn't matter. You've, you, this could be two rooms connected by a wall through which there's some permeation of the air from one to the other, maybe through a door or maybe through an HVAC system. I told you the story about the modeling that I did with the contaminant dispersal in a building. This is essentially what that model was, only I had... You know, 40 tanks of every room in there instead of just two. But you've got something coming into the first tank. You've got something leaving this tank, going to the other tank. Maybe you have an exchange where there is a pipe pushing a flow back to this tank, and then there's a tank out of this, or there's a flow out of the system. Now, for simplicity, I'm going to just set this model up. I'm not going to have additional pipes coming out separately for this one. If it's leaving tank A, it's going to tank B. And if it's leaving tank B, it's leaving the, the system. So it's not coming back in there. But it can go back. So each one of these have an out and an in, right? It's just that B's in comes from A. But A's also getting something in from two x so they have two ins and b has two outs the way that i've got this set up so it's kind of a serial tank you've got a main line coming into a an exchange between a and b and then something leaving b okay it's actually not that hard to do it where you've got an additional in to b an additional out from a but it, it, it all boils down to the same principle as before the concentration at any given time, actually the amount of the substance that we're modeling, in this case salt, at any given time T, is rate in minus rate out. So let's let X sub 1 be tank A and X sub 2 be tank B. Now here's what we know. Um, suppose that tank A contains 50 gallons of water. And at time 0, X, at, X1 at 0, we have... 25 pounds of salt. Tank B also contains 50 gallons, but it starts out at 
Zero. Because it's pure water. And I wish I'd given some more information. Because I don't have my notes. I don't remember what I was going to do with my variables between here. All right. You want to go the book? I'm going to go grab the book. Does it have the full statement of the problem? Yeah, I mean, it's the saying that three gallons of pure water is being pumped in A. Three gallons into A per minute. Per minute. What's the concentration coming in? Uh, it's pure. Pure coming into A? Yes, pure water. So zero um, pounds per gallon into A. Okay, what's the rate of exchange between A and B? Four gallons per minute. Four gallons per minute. Is it both ways or just that way? Uh, the, other the other one would be one gallon, right? One gallon. So that it stays constant, right? If you think about how much is coming in and how much is going out in terms of flow rate, it is three gallons per minute coming in and one gallon, so that's four gallons per minute coming in and four gallons going out. That's going to keep us at a constant volume. So, um, since four gallons are coming in to B and one gallon is leaving, this has to be three gallons per minute coming in. So that is actually enough information now to set up the system because remember that on all of these things that are leaving a tank, the concentration is volume, or I guess should say, um, amount over volume, which would be whichever variable xi we're talking about divided by 50. Since xi represents the amount of salt in either tank A or tank B at time t. So at any given time t, the amount leaving A here is going to be a, a concentration of x1 divided by 50. Right? So however much salt in there divided by 50 gallons. That's pounds per gallon. And then what's leaving B is actually x2 over 50. And what's leaving B here is also at a concentration of x2 over 50. So I didn't really make it clear what I'm talking about here, but all these yellow values here represent concentration, right? Whereas all these, if I do them in blue, those are all what I call the flow rate. So dx1 dt and dx2 dt is going to be rate in minus rate out. So let's look at tank A. How fast is the salt coming in, pounds per minute? Well, it's coming in from here at 3 gallons per minute times 0 pounds per gallon. And it's also coming in here at 1 gallon per minute times x2 over 50 pounds per gallon. And then it's leaving, so subtract what it's leaving at, which is 4 gallons per minute times, sorry, I'm running out of space here, scoot over, x1 over 50 pounds per gallon. So just in my first draft of this, I wanted to go ahead and put in units so that the units are clear to support my model, that they make sense, right? In every case, I'm getting pounds per minute, pounds per minute, pounds per minute, because that's what I'm modeling is the amount of salt at a given time t, so its rate of change would be pounds per minute. So this is all right here, the rate in, and this is the rate out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So dx2 would, would have the same kind of setup 
If you ride it all the way out, the rate in is just 4 gallons per minute times x1 over 50 pounds per gallon minus, that's all that's coming in. I'm going to subtract all of this. Now, technically, I, I would write it as one gallon per minute times x2 over 50 pounds per gallon plus three gallons per minute x2 over 50. But you should immediately see that that is, it doesn't matter where it's going, it just matters that it's leaving, right? You see that? So... One gallon and three gallons added together, you're still exiting four or releasing four gallons per minute of your X2 over 50. So this is still just four times X2 over 50. So if you simplify that and write it a lot simpler, X, um, DX1 DT, or even you could write X1 prime if you wanted to. This is zero, so you get x2 over 50 minus 4 cancels with the 50, what, 2x1 over 25, and dx2 dt would be 2x1 over 25 minus 2x2 over 25. There's your linear system with x1 at 0 being 25 and x2 at 0 being 0. Now, you, you obviously know, even without solving this, What's going to happen in the long term, right? Zero. Or no, no constriction. Yeah, the, the actual amount x1 and the actual amount x2 are going to go to zero. But what's going to happen to x2 at the beginning? It's going to increase for a while, and then it's begin to decrease after some period of time. To know exactly when those kinds of things happen, we would need to know the analytical solution to this, or at least some kind of numerical solve to be able to do this. <clears throat> There's actually, I mean, almost immediately you could do an Euler's uh, approximation of this in the same way that we did Euler's before. You just keep plugging in the previous point into, I'm not going to go through that. We'll talk about our numerical methods after we do our full study of the linear systems. But that's how you set one of these things up. Okay. So there will be at least a couple of homework problems where you're asked to set these things up uh, by hand, okay? Is it going to be um, which one's going to work? Uh, I don't know yet. I haven't actually assigned it. Okay. So there was no, not an anticipation that I'd be able to get through enough today. Um, there'll probably be an offline assignment along with 4.9 so that... Um, I'll have you do some modeling and then solve. More than likely, that's the way I'm going to handle that. All right. So, mixing problems, rate in minus rate out. You've got to figure out the concentrations. Um, just remember that anytime it's leaving a tank, the concentration is always the variable over its volume. They should provide for you the information about the actual um, flow rates in a problem. We can, we can measure those. In fact, uh, when I, when I were, whenever I was setting up that <clears throat> model where we were doing the contaminant dispersal, what we basically did was use experimental data to determine what was the actual exchange rate between, for example, if I were to close that door and turn off the HVAC system, there's still an air exchange between this room and the hallway. Um, there's some through the vent, there's some under the door, but there's even some level of permeation between the walls, depending on what type of wall you've got. Your painted cinder block had a different coefficient that would show up in there for that flow rate 
compared to drywall, compared to steel beams um, with the acoustic board that they were using. So it all depends on the actual setup. So uh, that was that. That's what makes the difference about how fast these things can exchange. But that information you would need to be able to actually set up the model. All right, let's do one other. Let's uh, let's do the predator prey model. So instead of modeling the population of a single organism like bacteria, which has exponential growth up until it reaches its carrying capacity and wherever it's growing, in those cases, that's where we talked about the um, logistic model to to model how an organism would grow if it did have a, a limiting capacity for how much its environment could hold. Now let's, let's turn that switch off. Let's go back to thinking about unlimited growth, but let's think about a coupled system where you've got two different organisms where one organism feeds off of the other. So we're going to take a very simple approach to this and say we've got these ideal mathematical foxes and ideal mathematical rabbits. Okay, And this ideal system is called the Latka-Volterra model. But what it does is it assumes some things about the relationship between these two organisms. First of all, um, if there were... These are the assumptions that make up this model. Let's, um, we're going to let X be foxes. X is foxes. And Y is rabbits. So if there were no rabbits, rabbits, the foxes would starve. Their population would begin to decline at a rate proportional to their population due to starvation. So that would mean that dx dt for no rabbits would be like a negative, and I'm just going to, I'm not you're probably going to choose the right numbers from the book. I didn't even bring my book with me. Let me pull the book up since I've got it right here. Well, we're going to assume it, it declines over time. Some are more resilient than others. <laughs> some, are eating some are eating each first. other at first, yeah. right? Yeah. Or maybe there are alternative food sources, but not enough to sustain them in the long term. They begin to die off exponentially. That's the assumption. Uh, where's my ebook? Here's my ebook. Well, what, again, we just like any modeling exercise, we start with the simplest, and then we build up from there and, and, and go back and consider modeling these things differently. By the way, remember also, this class uses continuous variables to represent sometimes discrete quantities in the real world because the mathematics is easier to handle and better to solve and usually is powerful enough to, to actually model what's happening. There are what are called difference equations. Difference equations are based on discrete models where your variables only can take on integer values or whole number values. Um, or the independent variable, t, is not a um, continuous interval but a discrete time interval. And so in both of those different cases, you have a different scenario. We're, again, starting with the simplest of, of cases. So 3, 3, modeling. I'll, I want to match his uh, variable choices or parameter choices. Okay, so negative AX. Now, if there are rabbits, then the growth of the foxes is proportional to the number of interactions between the foxes and rabbits. Okay, so the more rabbits there are, the more interactions there will be. The more foxes there are, the more interactions there'll be. So what we assume is the number of interactions is a joint proportionality. They are jointly proportional. So what I would say then is that dx dt would be equal to, and he uses the b. Now the minus ax, that's the rate they decline when there are no rabbits. But if there are rabbits, then they are going to grow at a, some fractional rate proportional to the number of interactions between x and y, which can be modeled by the product of x and y. So notice how when y is 0 here, this is in fact does match up here, 
when there are no rabbits. Okay? Now, same story is going to be true for rabbits on the reverse. We're going to assume rabbits have their own food supply and that they can grow exponentially without limitation. So dy, dt, when there are no foxes, would be, I think he uses, I assume he uses c, y. And it's positive now, because there's growth. Or d, he would use d, gosh. I can fix that. Boom! I need to write my own. Do what? I know. Why would you use D with derivatives? Okay. So this would be, look at that script D. How's that? i tell you a story about the guy that taught me stats at graduate school. Because there's like, in stats we use things like uh, the random variable X, which is capitalized. And then there's the instance of the variable, which is x. And then there was a chi-squared distribution, which was this. And then there was a lowercase x that he used as a variable in the problem. Not a random variable, not an instance of the random variable, but some other. He put all four of these in the same problem. God. No. Same set of notes. And his handwriting was beautiful. It's the most beautiful handwriting I'd ever seen. Puts Dr. Hans to shame. It was amazing. But you could tell very easily the difference between the two, three, or four of these that they had, but I never could. On my notes, my notes, I go back and it's like, what the? <laughs> really? True. I couldn't take pictures. We didn't have camera phones, man. <laughs> yeah, Walk into class with my big old digital Hold on, film camera. Hold batteries in the flat. Yeah. Now, if there are a number of interactions between fox and rabbits, those are bad for the, for the rabbit, right? Good for the fox but bad for the rabbit. So we're going to do D, um, Y, D, T. When there are foxes present will be the D, Y minus a C, X, Y. Now we're going to see his magic fist on the equation. So D, X, D, T is... Uh, the first, or number two, which would be negative AX plus BXY, and then DX, oh, sorry, DY DT is DY minus CXY. And then those parameters, A, B, C, and D, are determined experimentally. They're determined empirically by measuring actual populations and seeing the impact that those interactions have to try to fit this model to a real-world scenario. So, if you now throw open your browser and go to that URL, which I hope will still work. It's been a couple editions back that they were using this. I didn't go back and look up it on uh, the Wolfram Alpha demonstrations, but I'm going to go to snipurl.com slash... DE tool. Oops, let's go to snip URL. Good stuff. Oh, I got it. I don't know. I'm going to post the direct link to it. I think Wayland may be blocking SNP URL as a tool. What are we working in Chapter 3, or Predator Prey? Chapter yeah, three? Chapter 3, Predator Prey. It looks like this. I'm going to post this direct link to it in Blackboard. So if you're having trouble getting there, let's... Uh, I'll just post it under web resources in our Blackboard course. Uh, links to DE tools online. Item. No, no, well, that's better. Web link. D 
DE tool textbook sill. This actually has a few other things we could play with. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, don't click it yet. Oh, I did, I did. I wanted to make sure it opened in a new window. Which it is, okay. Boom, chakalaga, there it is. So now, I'm going to go to chapter 3, Predator Prey. And what you see here is a solution model of the X and Y populations plotted against each other. So the horizontal axis is the number of foxes. The vertical axis is the number of rabbits. And then this slider up here will give you an initial starting point for the number of, uh, this one over here, number of rabbits. So if we start with 10 and 10, now those don't necessarily mean 10 rabbits and 10 foxes. They may mean 10 million or 10,000, whatever. Yes? Uh, what, what did you name the DE tool when you put it in whiteboard? It's the last one, DE tool, textbook zil. I didn't want to just call it predator prey because there's actually a lot of stuff we'll go, we could come back and look at. I'm going to look at the spring mass system in, a, in another day or two. Okay, so notice the sliders here. Again, we're assuming A, B, C, and D are all positive values. As we move A, remember A represents the growth rate for the foxes. So I, I should say the decay rate, that is how fast they die off. So if they die off faster when there's no food, then this is what the shape looks like. Notice, by the way, we're actually looking at two different graphs. We're looking at what's called the phase plane for x and y. That is x plotted against y. So two dependent variables plotted against each other. Okay. What really makes a little bit more sense to think about is the population over time for x and for y. So the foxes x is the blue line, right? And then the rabbits are the green line. Now, as you look through this, I'm going to stretch this out a little bit this way. Let's do uh, 0.01 for B and 0.1 for A. I'm going to leave D at 0.36, which was where it was when I got here, and 0.050, which is where it was when I got here. <coughs> So it almost looks sine wave-like, but as you look at this wave for the foxes, it actually is a little bit skewed. It's kind of bent towards the left-hand side of the, the wave function, and it's a little pointier than a sine wave. But notice, as the system starts for this particular model, there are not enough rabbits to feed the fox population. So what happens to the fox population? It begins to decline. And as it declines, the rate of dying off, or I guess the feeding rate as it's being, as they're, as they're being devoured by these foxes, begins to slow for the rabbits. And then at some point, the rabbits begin to recover and their population begins to accelerate. Okay. Now then there is a delay but as it begins to accelerate, eventually the growth rate of the foxes, or I guess the decline rate, starts to slow down and it begins to grow again when there's sufficient food for them and then they begin to grow and then you see this pattern of a cycle. And the cycle is occurring. You can recognize that it's a cyclical behavior by looking at the phase plane graph over here. Okay. You mean down here? Uh, or like when it gets to right there? Yep. So what would you call a point like that? An equilibrium point. Because from there, it doesn't move. How would you find an equilibrium point, do you think? Set the system equal to zero. That is, set the dx dt equal to zero and the dy dt equal to zero and solve for x and y. 
right? And you would see then that that forms an equilibrium point. Exactly. And we'll be doing some of that kind of qualitative analysis. These will become, these phase diagrams are going to be just like the phase diagrams we did for one-dimensional systems, that is one variable y. Now we're going to be looking at what's the behavior on regions of the plane instead of on intervals on the line, right? Remember? And so we, we had, we'll have stability areas. We'll actually be able to look at this point right here is whether or not that's an asymptotically stable point or is it just stable. This case, when I move a little bit away from there, I form this cycle, which is still stable. It doesn't blow up. But there are some types of equations where if I move just a little bit off, it now shoots off into a different direction. There will also be in our phase diagrams lines where things asymptotically approach the lines. The direction of those lines end up corresponding with eigenvectors for the linear system that we start with. So it'll be some fun exploration to kind of go down that road. But now, at least at the very least, you see some of the impact of, the, of those systems. All right. With that, that's all I'm going to do on 3.3. I'm now ready to turn the page and go on to 4.9. What 4.9 does is I'm going to now solve some linear systems, and I'm going to develop a solution technique that, sh that makes pretty good sense, but turns out to be, like I said, a little bit long to do the process. Okay, so let me switch to 4.9. You pull out your 4.9, and yes, I did a poor job. I did not type up a lot of this stuff, so we're just going to write it. I debated of like walking over and just buying notebook paper, paper for you, handing out blank sheets from the printer to let you take notes on. Yeah. But I thought I'd give you some lines. That would have been probably worse. By the way, we have exhausted the notes that I've prepared in previous sections of the course that is that I've typed up yeah. I mean I've got handwritten notes from all the times I've taught traditionally over here but uh, 